Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the ASEAN Sustainable Urbanization Forum 2021. My name is Ryan Sequera. I'm senior urban mobility expert with UN Habitat based at the headquarters in Nairobi. And I will be moderating this thematic session on mobility today. So the, this thematic dialogue aims to reflect on the challenges and opportunities related to implementation of sustainable urban, urban mobility. Throughout this forum, different thematic dialogues will offer the opportunity to discuss and reflect on the main areas that the ASEAN Sustainable Urbanization Strategy, or ACES, identifies as priorities for ASEAN cities to further sustainable urbanization. So as a matter of introduction, ACES is a sustainable urbanization framework that was launched in 2018 to provide ASEAN cities with an analysis of urban trends and priority areas for urban development in the region and two accompanying toolkits that aim to assist local governments in ASEAN to advance sustainable urbanization in their cities. One of the main priority areas identified by ACES is built infrastructure, which includes mobility as its priority sub area. And that is the topic of discussion for today. So as a, to introduce the theme of today's session, we are going to look at developing and enhancing sustainable transport systems in ASEAN cities, which is a fundamental priority to improve the quality of the environment and the living standards of everyone in ASEAN. ACES highlights that many cities in ASEAN suffer from an underdeveloped transport system that affects citizens through marginalization of underserved areas and supporting the progressive increase of private mode share. Moreover, sustainable mobility is important not only because congestion is a major concern, but according to the WHO, the average number of road fatalities across the Asian member states is higher, approximately 18 per 100,000, than the global average, which is approximately 15.8 per 100,000. This was based on a study of 193 countries globally. Sustainable solutions are indeed necessary to provide a more accessible, affordable, safe, and energy efficient service. The integration of different transport modes, including non-motorized transport, and the adoption of technologies to improve the traffic management are among the several actions that can contribute to create better cities through better urban mobility. So today, we are going to go through the session in the format that I lay out right now. So first, we will have a city presentation by uh, a representative from General Santos. We will move on to a panel discussion by some panelists who are on board, and then finally have an audience question and answer. So as a matter of introduction, first, let me introduce our city representative, who is uh, engineer Riza Mari Paches. She is a licensed civil engineer and environmental planner with 25 years of experience in public service, specifically in areas of development planning, transportation, and project management. She currently heads the public safety office of General Santos City, and under her leadership are the divisions of traffic engineering, command and control center, traffic management, civil security, disaster, and disaster risk reduction and management. To introduce the remaining panelists, we also have uh, Professor Jennifer Oxley, who is the Associate Director of Monash University Accident Research Center, that is MUARC. We also have Dr. David Logan, who is a Senior Research Fellow, also at the Monash University Accident Research Center. We have Associate Professor Sorawit Narupiti, who is the President of ITS Thailand and Associate Professor of Civil Engineering and Transportation in Chulalongkorn University. And lastly, we have Alvin Mejia, who is Research Fellow at the Wuppertal Institute for Climate, Environment and Energy. I will now hand over the stage to Engineer Riza Paches to begin the session uh, and her presentation on General Santos. Welcome, Riza. 
Thank you, Ryan, for the kind introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning and uh, good day. You know? uh, to esteemed members of the organizing committee, the honorable guests, speakers, and ladies and gentlemen in the gallery, good afternoon and have a nice day today. It is indeed an honor for us and a pleasure to present to you uh, the General Santo City ASUS project on sustainable urban mobility, uh, particularly in coming up with an integrated sustainable transport and traffic management. Uh, for the city context, uh, I just would like to give a background in terms of uh, the goals of the project that we're undertaking. This is basically to ensure the alignment of the priority plans of the city to that of the national government towards an efficient and sustainable transportation system management. The slide you're seeing right now is just putting context into how we aligned our local plans to the National uh, Physical Framework Plan, which puts General Santos City as a dominant figure in uh, putting in the international gateway, considering we have an international airport in our midst. And we also tried to put context in terms of its role in the island of Mindanao, uh, pur purposely serving for the agro-industrial center of the island. And we also try to cascade that to the regional development plan, which is basically trying to put in an integrated and effective transport system. With this in context, uh, our local plans is geared towards uh, maximizing and leveraging uh, the transport uh, resource that we have uh, in order to have a sustainable operation. Our city, uh, next slide, please. So if everybody's wondering, uh, go back and one slide. Okay. Uh, Jensan is located at the southernmost part of the Philippines and is closest more to the BIMP Iaga. We are only a uh, mid-sized city with a population of uh, less than a million. Uh, right now, we are at 695,000. Uh, and our uh, growth trend is uh, increasing. Uh, th this puts pressure to the demand for an efficient and effective public transport service in the city. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in trying to uh, determine our um, projects and priorities, uh, we were able to uh, assess challenges and opportunities in the assessment that we conducted at the initial stage of the project with assistance from UN Habitat, we were able to identify difficulties in implementation, particularly in the enforcement of our local policies, ordinances, and programs. And we also see that uh, the LGU has limited capacity basically to handle uh, data management. And with the pandemic, our financial resources are being challenged, uh, putting much pressure into our financial capability to implement projects that we have identified. And of course, with the coming elections and uh, the political scenario uh, in the country, we are also experiencing a challenge in the continuity of plans and in the development priorities that are set. And of course, there's that uh, challenge on uh, the data um, establishment of a comprehensive profiling for the different transportation sectors. But with that, we also see certain silver lining into uh, the situation that the local government is right now. Uh, the local government uh, is always adamant and trying to pursue the improvement in the public transport, particularly in addressing competing uh, sectors of uh, non-formal and formal transportation over time. And we see that uh, there's a strong participation actually of different local institutions, both from the non-government organizations to the civil society, as well as the convergence of programs coming from the national uh, agencies. Uh, we are also seeing an emergence in terms of uh, the conduct of collaboration and research uh, development uh, with our local universities and even uh, universities at the national level particularly the ones we are undertaking with the University of the Philippines. Uh, this is primarily to help us maximize the utilization and improve the service of the public transportation in the city. Uh, when the national government um, downloaded the policy or the national 
transport policy and the formulation of the local public transport route plan, the city was in the forefront being the first LGU to submit and comply with the policies of the national government. So we really took a uh, premium into aligning our um, actions into the national programs. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Okay, so with that in mind and having assessed our current situations, the challenges, as well as the opportunities that we have in the public transport sector, we were able to identify at least seven or eight interventions uh, categorized between putting in the proper and right infrastructure to support public transport service. We also tried to consider putting in more environment-friendly uh, uh, public transport service. And the third and the fourth intervention really focuses on our local capacity, particularly in organizational development and capacity building. So our interventions are shown in the slides, particularly in putting in the right infrastructure to enable the commuters to really patronize the public transport service offered by the four-wheel vehicle. Uh, if you, I would like to note that Jensen actually has a competing uh, transport service uh, served by the three wheelers, which are, which are the informal uh, public transport service and the four wheel vehicle, which is uh, offering basically a more formal operation. Uh, with this, we have identified putting in our uh, public transport uh, user transfer station so that we can formalize vehicle stops within the city and to also try to reduce traffic uh, incidents we will put in more uh, traffic signalization in key intersections of the local government. And with the strengthening of the environment-friendly public transport, we would like to par add on to our current resource of using uh, electric jeepneys as the primary mode of transportation and also trying to promote the use of other low carbon emission vehicles. Uh, right now, we are having an initial operation of all these kinds of vehicle, but we see that if we want to increase and comply more to international standards in terms of greenhouse gas reduction, then we need to be able to uh, increase our fleet uh, capacity. And of course, we really want to rationalize and put in a, an upgrading system for the informal vehicles, particularly the tricycle. Uh, we would want to improve their conditions in terms of uh, being cost effective. And also we would like to see more of the retirement of old units and convert them into much cleaner public transport. Next slide, please. In terms of the organizational intervention, uh, only recently that the local government established an integrated office that will handle public transportation, uh, disaster management, and even traffic enforcement. And this is we're looking into the creation of certain project management units to handle projects that are proposed in our master plan so that it will not put pressure and competing uh, priorities to our law enforcement. We will be separating the implementation of the infrastructure project with the operation of the public safety office and of course we would like to look into a more capacitized public safety office in terms of uh, how to intervene and try to bring together all the public transport stakeholder so that we will have uh, order and safety on the streets and most importantly we do not discount the possibility of really trying to continually update and revise the transport plan uh, considering uh, the current situation of uh, sustainability of urban mobility in the pandemic era so the city is also trying to move into that and enhancing uh, the existing plans that we have uh, the last slide would basically uh, the next slide please uh, this would basically highlight uh, two of the most uh, critical challenges that the city is facing, uh, even transitioning from the current manual operation to introducing technology solution, is basically trying to look into our um, inability to really try to um, implement technology solutions and even try to leverage our uh, stakeholders into uh, 
uh, adapting this kind of uh, technology solution into their operation. And most importantly, uh, the ones that are hindering us from moving forward with uh, what we have laid down as an intervention is basically the financial capability. This is basically uh, looking into accessing uh, financial assistance to support uh, the capital investment in the upgrading of our current public transport from that of a more positive to a lesser positive uh, public transport operation. Uh, with that, I think uh, that would be the uh, most of the uh, interventions and even challenges that we have uh, in trying to establish a sustainable public transport system in the city. Uh, Ryan, I think that would be it. And I would be glad to listen and answer to questions if there are any. Thank you. Thank you so much, Riza. Um, it was a, it was great listening to such a short but uh, packed presentation on all your work that is tying in not only informal uh, uh, operators but also the financial aspects of it and public safety as well to give a holistic ecosystem of sustainable mobility. Uh, so the next part that we would move in for this session is the panel discussion itself, where we will also have questions to you. So I will request uh, technical experts to uh, uh, please uh, put the other panelists on the screen as well. Uh, just to remind uh, the participants of the Q&A function, please post in your questions over there and we will address them at the Q&A segment right at the end. So for this panel discussion, I will start by uh, positing a question to each of our panelists. And after that, a general question to the entire panel and hope to have a bit of back and forth in terms of discussion over there. And lastly, we will move to the audience Q&A. Uh, please keep it to about three to four minutes per answer. Thank you so much. So. Uh, Riza, my first question is to you, and uh, this is based on what you presented. So uh, an efficient transport system, of course, requires a strong integration between the various transport modes and also the different operators, which is also what you spoke about. But the lack of coordination between the relevant city departments and stakeholders sometimes lead to an inefficient service, especially when they concern uh, the informal operators. So what are your considerations and experiences in bringing together the relevant stakeholders to collaborate and integrate different roles in a public transport project or plan such that there is a holistic ecosystem for the city? Uh, Riza, I think you're on mute. Okay, so thank you, Ryan. Uh, it's, it's good that you pointed out the importance of really engaging the stakeholders. Uh, you see, Jensen, when it tries to address its public transport, did not start from a para scratch. No, uh, We already have uh, existing collaboration with particularly the service providers, and it's very, very important that we help them in their organizational strengthening. Uh, in General Santo City, we are actively promoting cooperativism as a way to organize our public transport sector. So the different um, departments of General Santo City are working together. Uh, we have the economic uh, office to assist them in their um, financial uh, challenges and also in their organization. And there are also other offices that are helping out uh, to provide um, adequate services in promoting um, stakeholder participation. We also have what we call the City Development Council, wherein almost 30% represented are the private sector. So it's very important because we realize that in order to solve public transport problems, we really need to adopt a whole of society approach meaning to say we bring in all the stakeholders, both state and non-state actors, into the table and try to come up with a plan that uh, more or less uh, covers all the aspects of uh, the operation of the public transportation. Uh, what's interesting in General Santo City recently is we got to involve the uh, local universities into our process 
by which uh, some of our research activities are channeled to them. I um, mean to say they provide a resource wherein the city lacks the resource for research and development. So these are actually uh, certain collaboration initiatives that we have um, initiated, uh, particularly assisted by uh, the University of the Philippines. They are two is capacitating our local university. So Ryan, this is really trying to put in everybody with the local government as the one integrating and coordinating because we realize uh, linkages is very important when we try to address complex problems such as transportation. So I hope I have uh, shared uh, quite a bit into the uh, question. Thank you, Ryan. Indeed, indeed. Thank you for uh, painting this wonderful picture of uh, the entire ecosystem of uh, General Santos coming together for uh, a larger goal of sustainable mobility. My next question is to Sorovit, uh, and this is based on your uh, expertise in technology and ITS. So digital technologies are allowing a great data collection and analysis to improve traffic management. However, this uh, data collection can be costly and requires a lot of technical expertise to analyze and make sense out of and even uh, utilize in making planning decisions. So from your experience, what are the key success factors for local governments in adopting digital technologies and how would you suggest that they implement efficient traffic management systems based on the data that they collect and analyze? Okay, thank you very much and, and uh, hi everyone. Uh, I like to share my experience on working with the data for uh, getting a good uh, traffic measures uh, in terms of more efficient traffic management. Actually, uh, the use of data and digital technologies can be applied for the general uh, planning of sustainable mobility though. Um, I, first of all, I do agree with Risa that uh, involvement of stakeholder is quite important. And we have good experience on this one as well. Uh, my experience on sustainable mobility project, we called uh, Saturn model back in 2014. And in that uh, particular project, we look at not only for uh, digital technology solutions, but also some other solutions like demand management, and improvement of public transportation and others as well. So we found a lot of key success factors from that project. Uh, we we have, we, I can conclude in two, two words, people awareness and social con collaboration. Uh, this project is unique in that normally when we talk about uh, uh, developing a project and implement a project, we talk about uh, what we can do and apply. Maybe uh, one person will do everything. But uh, in this particular project, we start with, uh, we want to change the paradigm from the steps that we have thinkers, doer, and users. Like, uh, okay, no connection into think and do together. So we take the collaborative approach that we start from, you know, including everyone. So to do this, you know, not only, you know, we, we understand uh, uh, each measures very well, especially for digital technologies and technologies uh, aspects, but also how we incorporate uh, working together in the collaborative ways. And uh, in this uh, particular uh, project, we found good results that uh, with collaboration, we can make it happen. And specifically for the another project we work on is we call Rama4 uh, model project. In this particular project, we look uh, especially for the data and technologies, how we utilize data for um, better, more efficient uh, traffic management. Of course, we, we learn from experience that from Saturn module project that with the collaborative approach, we get we can get more better solutions from everyone, especially uh, 
uh, we found that even though we can make one major for the city, even public transportation improvement, even we in incorporate more technologies, but we need to make sure the challenge for us is how to involve community interest, how to make a more political view and the commitment to the project. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Soravit. It was good to hear that even in the middle of all the technology and uh, adoption of new methods of uh, traffic and transportation, that at the heart of it is people and also community. And I loved how you brought about the importance of collaboration in uh, dealing with these issues. Uh, I'll post my next question to Alvin. And this is uh, based on energy and uh, the, uh, the uh, sustainable transport from the energy perspective. So energy efficient transport means could mean an electric bus. And it, it is a key solution for cities to abandon fossil fuel dependency. Uh, and these are, of course, becoming more and more competitive and cost efficient and a number of alternatives coming into the market. Could you share from your experience uh, some challenges and opportunities that Asian cities would need to face to accelerate a transition to electric mobility or other sustainable energy transportation? Uh, thank you very much, Ryan. Uh, good day to everyone. Um, um, I think in, in terms of the, the transition in general, um, in, um, when we talk about, let's say, um, technological transitions, uh, um, e-mobility as well as um, uh, things that are happening in terms of the digitalization space, I think we need to recognize that these are not just relegated to the technology shifts, but these are really embedded in, in, in transformations in terms of the socio-technical systems. And uh, in terms of that, um, one of the key uh, challenges that I see in, in addition to what uh, Engineer Riza has mentioned earlier in terms of the technical and financial uh, challenges, we also need to look into the, uh, the overall governance aspect. Um, in, in ASEAN's, uh, in ASEAN uh, uh, member states, uh, we, we do recognize that it's, it's um, uh, there's a lot of complexities in how urban transportation systems are uh, governed. So we look at different uh, um, ownership operation structures, uh, different unique and multiple modes of uh, transport at the urban level and also um, uh, heavy dependence on uh, informal uh, transit uh, uh, transport modes. And um, we need to recognize that we need to address the, uh, the, the lateral as well as the multi-scalar gaps in terms of uh, urban transportation planning and management. Um, one of the key things that the engineer Risa also mentioned earlier was relating to knowing the sector um, um, in terms of baselining, in terms of really, um, you know, having a good grasp of what is happening on ground. Um, and the, the, the entry of uh, e-mobility and other innovations, uh, uh, sustainable uh, mobility innovations, um, you'd see um, additional layers being added to the, the, the current complex system. So we talk about um, complexities that relate to the, let's say, the, the, the infrastructure, the charging infrastructure, the digital infrastructure that we need. Um, we need to look into how our regulations and incentives um, need to transform to be able to, to support um, 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 sustainable modes moving forward. Um, and we also need to recognize that um, the risk distribution, this is something that we need to address um, through the, the financing schemes um, that, uh, that we would be developing as well as looking into different business models. Um, because there's a lot of, uh, let's say, latent uh, interest and capacities, for example, from the private sector that we need to mobilize. Um, but the key thing here is that uh, we need to demonstrate. So I think one of the opportunities right now is that uh, in terms of the, uh, the market per se, um, the overall um, technological and policy paradigms, um, these are gearing towards more, um, you know, sustainable um, mobility mm -hmm. modes and systems, and we need to capitalize them. Um, these so we're doing a project in uh, right now it's an eu funded project uh, we're working with the cities of pasig hanoi and Kathmandu in asia and what we're trying to do there is really to build um, um cohesive demonstrations through 
urban uh, living labs, wherein we do not only look at the technology, but we look at the different aspects, the business models, the, the policy, the financing um, aspects, to be able to, to look into scaling up uh, some of these e-mobility and uh, digital solutions. So I think um, the market is uh, um, um, within this uh, stage that it can be, um, you know, it, it, towards the takeoff and um, we just need to capitalize and and as well as um, looking at the other regions as well it's just a lot of lessons um, um, you know that on e-mobility digitalizations that are happening we don't need to start from scratch but we need to to capitalize and and you know um, have these uh, discussions as well with the different uh, uh, global experiences thank you thanks Alvin uh, I like how even here, there are links to our previous uh, speakers. You spoke about um, the social and technical systems that goes back to what Sorovit was talking about, people and community. But you also talked about uh, structuring the governance uh, and creating regulations and incentives for push and pull factors. Uh, that was uh, also what was uh, spoken about by Riza earlier. And I think it's very important, of course, like you mentioned, to manage risk and uh, factor that into the financing of the system going forward. And these are, I think, extremely uh, important in uh, changing the energy system and the energy landscape uh, for mobility in the future. My next question will be to Jennifer. So this will be on uh, uh, relation to active and non-motorized transportation. So active travel and public transportation are important contributors to urban sustainability. From your experience, what are the potential benefits and risks to cities and citizens in promoting travel mode shifts to these modes? Fantastic. Thank you, Ryan, and thank you very much for the invitation to present uh, this afternoon. Um, I will speak first and then I will hand over to my colleague, David Logan, to, to um, finish uh, our session. So we were asked to really talk about um, the sustainable transport from a road safety perspective. So I just wanted to give you a, a, a broad overview of uh, where we're at in, in road safety and, and um, how it impacts um, sustainable transport. And David will, will follow up with a few more details. So around the world, um, about 1.4 million people die each year on our roads and, uh, and up to 50 million people are injured. 90% of these are, are, are in low and middle income countries. So road safety really is um, a huge public, uh, public health issue worldwide. Many, many countries around the world um, have adopted or intend to adopt um, the principles of the safe system approach. Um, and there are lots of principles around that, but I guess the most important thing for us is that the safe system um, guides us to say that no one should be killed or seriously injured on the road system and that there shouldn't be a trade-off between mobility and safety. So it's important that we have safety in that mix, mix there. Now, there are many countries that have adopted safe system principles and good road safety management. Um, and and th those ones who have adopted this approach are very much the best performing countries in the world. So we need to look to the, the road safety management in those countries. Of course, we know that the safe system principles are aspirational, um, but we also know that most countries around the world have set a target um, of a 50% reduction in deaths and serious injuries, and many are aiming at zero deaths by 2050. Most recently, um, we, uh, we, we have developed the Stockholm Declaration for Road Safety, um, and this was launched at the third Global Ministerial Conference in Road Safety last year in Sweden. And this really um, is a bit of a shift um, in where road safety is placed in the global agenda. And this declaration and its supporting documents really place road safety squarely aligned with the implementation of the UN's 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Um, so it also points out that road safety and saving people's lives is a necessity for achieving the SDGs. So I'll hand over to David now to take you through a little bit more detail. Thanks, Jenny, and welcome, everyone. Yeah, the, the Declaration acknowledges that the Sustainable de Development Goals are, are all interdependent with one another and they, they must be addressed in an integrated way. So we have to look at road safety as it, as it interacts with mental and physical health, 
development, education, equity, gender equality, sustainable cities, the environment and climate change as well as, as some of the other social determinants of safety. So it, the, the, the declaration stresses that road safety has to be integrated uh, along with the safe system approach with land use, street design, transport system planning and governance. So we can't just tack road safety on at the end, it must be integrated right through the whole process. And there's a particular focus on vulnerable road users and in urban areas, which of course is very relevant to our discussions today. The declaration focuses on safer vehicles and safer road infrastructure for all road users. Now, even though we're talking about public transportation, it's, it's likely that despite our efforts to promote active travel and public transportation, transport by light passenger vehicles is likely to continue to serve a large proportion of the transport task for at least the next 10 to 20 years. So we can't neglect that aspect of the road system, even as we try and promote a, a shift in, in transport modes. So what this really means in practice is that if we're to encourage transport mode shifts to active, active, excuse me, active travel and increase public transportation, we have to ensure that this is achieved without compromising safety. So to do this in each environment, we need to cater for the most vulnerable road user. And that means we design appropriate infrastructure that can operate at speeds that are compatible with the human tolerance for injury. And that of course varies as to whether you're an unprotected pedestrian, motorcyclist or scooter rider, or if you're in a vehicle like a public transport vehicle or a car. So for example, if we want to allow pedestrians to mix with motorized traffic as happens um, incredibly commonly in, in many low and middle income countries, we must ensure that speeds do not exceed 30 kilometers an hour. Now this is at odds with, um, with, with many urban environments around the world. Um, the, the World Bank reports that there's probably only maybe 20 to 30 percent of, of all the environments worldwide where urban speeds are lower than 50 or 60 kilometres an hour. So we have to change that. And for example, public transportation, we know from a lot of studies that buses and trains are a very safe mode of transport in themselves. But the transit interchanges are where there's a real problem. We have people exposed to motorised traffic, we have exposure to falls, and all of these compromise safety and, and these compromises are inherent in, in the, the, the transfer to active travel and, um, and public transportation. And we need to address those by integrating that with the design of, of these interchanges. So in summary, we, we need to ensure that the, the many undoubted huge number of benefits of the shift towards active travel and public transportation are realised without cost, costing hospitalisations and lives. And I think the key is that we can't accommodate safety um, as an add-on. We can't accommodate it after other changes have been made. We have to design safety in to any of our plans for transport mode shift. And that's all I have to say right now, but we're happy to answer any other questions that the audience might have or we wish to discuss later. Thank you. Thank you so much, David and uh, Jenny also earlier. And I think uh, both of you have raised very pertinent points about how safety of a mode is what would determine its usage and that is what if it's not taken care of in planning the mode itself it acts as a reduction in the number of people who would use that mode eventually uh, also some excellent points about uh, taking care of the interchange between various modes and if we do that strategically and think about transportation as a holistic landscape only then will we be able to prioritize uh, vulnerable users and NMT and pedestrians as well. So we'll move on to the next part of the panel, which is uh, more open-ended questions to all our panelists. So please feel free to chip into any of these. Uh, we would like it to be a little bit of back and forth, but uh, each question to be about totally uh, four minutes, so maybe a minute, minute and a half per uh, answer. So my first one is regarding citizen engagement, which has been recognized as vital and necessary for ensuring that urban planning interventions have maximum impact. Unfortunately, this process is sometimes complex, time consuming and costly, although it is extremely necessary. But from your experience, what activities should an urban developer or decision maker implement to ensure that community participation happens? And how do these activities change and contribute to the project outcomes, which makes the, the cost and the time well worth its, uh, its input? Can I take the first answer, uh, Ryan? 
Uh, yes. In the case of Jerusalem, what's interesting in the current engagement that we have is, uh, oh, by the way, the opinion earlier and the expert advice of our guest uh, only validates that we are moving in the right direction. For one, our engagement with uh, the UP and SIPAG group, uh, we are implementing right now a data analytics for research and education program which basically uh, tries to uh, promote data sharing, uh, collaborative research, and even public transport crowdsourcing through the use of uh, certain apps and technology. Uh, in, in terms of para, uh, crowdsourcing uh, and doing the uh, monitoring and evaluation of the public transport service uh, through the use of uh, cell phone and uh, other online applications uh, locally developed and deployed to be um, practiced in the city of General Santos. Bo both the public transport service uh, cooperatives or the ones operating the public transport as well as the commuter are using the same platform or using the same application. And so the local government is able to tie up uh, what the public uh, commuter is uh, uh, informing us about the status of the operation and at the same time we are able to give feedback to the uh, public transport operators based on this uh, engagement and platform at the end of the day the goal of the engagement would be collaborative governance in the public transport sector and also try to establish a data support for any decision making that the local government or the uh, urban planners in the city is going to have. So I think um, I would like to really um, capitalize on the different points given to us. Uh, rest assured that we will put them into context. Uh, Logan's suggestion to really mainstream road safety into even to the planning and uh, project development aspect and not just a an add-on to what we are doing. And of course, the other... Um, points raised by Sir uh, Alvin on the use of technology and capitalizing also on the ones uh, shared by Professor Surobit. So uh, we are really thankful to have this kind of insights and the local government now can be an area for application of these kinds of uh, theories, frameworks, and even experiences that has been proven and tested in, in other areas. So this is just a a very good day for the local government. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Riza. Does anyone want to respond to that or add any more aspects? Yes, sir, of it, please. Yes, um, i like to add uh, the aspect of data analytics because um, this is good for not only citizen engagement, but also the help the whole project movement as, as a whole. Traditionally, we, we try to get the data like the urban planner or decision maker to make a decision and the data will be fed to those people. But uh, if we shift the paradigm, uh, make the use of data in the wider range of uh, maybe contact connecting with all stakeholders. Uh, in Rama 4 project I mentioned earlier, we used uh, the motto, see the whole elephant as the, the way we approach the, the data. See, at the moment, if we blindfold everyone, each stakeholder touch the, the elephant. One touch, one touches the, the leg, one touches the belly. They, they, they can think of uh, the, the same thing, you know, they might guess the, the different way, the different animals. But if we uh, expose all the data to all stakeholders, I think this is a good, good way to go and people have a, the same understanding. At the beginning, they, they understand that uh, this is the problem, this is the way it goes, and if we do this, what, what's gonna happen? It helps also during the operation. You know, see, uh, we found the problems that even though we have many stakeholders, but, but when they work together, they need some kind of collaboration and data would be the linkage, a good linkage for them to, to have a good collaboration and good operation all together. Thank you. Thanks, Sorovit. Um, I'll move on to the next question. 
So this is uh, again related to technology and traffic management systems that require training in supporting of local officials for and traffic enforcement agencies, also for uh, transport planning and other operators as well. Uh, could you all share some best practices and lessons learned where adopting capacity building plans and activities can ensure the implementation process and improve partnerships? Does anyone want to talk about capacity building? Jenny, I, yes. Yeah, I, I could make one comment, but it's very much um, from a road safety perspective. Um, what we find, you know, in in many countries, um, there is a real need to understand capacity uh, within governments, but also NGOs. Uh, you know, to be able to work together, we'll, we'll understand what their country needs and and how that they can work together. And I think um, this sort of links into the, the question, uh, the, the discussion before, but it's so, so important to have your partnerships um, between your government agencies. So you're all working together and, and all, you know, know your roles and responsibilities, but you're all working towards the same end. And I think David was going to actually say that the same point just before, but, you know, I think the capacity building is so crucial but you know to really un to undertake capacity reviews to really understand where the gaps are um, and then then you can talk about well what are the solutions to to increase that capacity okay thank you does anyone want to respond to jenny Hi, hi, Ryan. Yes, Alvin, please. Yes, maybe in in addition to that, uh, thank you very much, Jenny, for for the wonderful insights on uh, on, on you know, the linkages. Maybe something at the, to consider also at the CN level, maybe to support the uh, the sustainable urban uh, strategy. Um, if if some sort of um, action plan or, or you know uh, at the regional level, where in the different member states can look into specific uh, capacities that they have um or, or have uh, let's say um expertise on in relation to um certain elements of sustainability uh sustainable mobility uh urban mobility in general um maybe that's something that can be explored um the different uh, cities are and that uh, the different cities member states are um you know um doing different uh, different levels of activities in the different dimensions related to uh, sustainable mobility. We talk about uh, maybe planning on the data. Um, um, open data strategies, for example, is very important. We, I think we can uh, learn a lot, for example, from um, what's happening in, in Singapore. Um, we do have um, a lot of expertise in terms of, um, you know, even at the level of, uh, let's say, um, moving towards more um, safe, efficient, and sustainable um, uh, uh, vehicles that can be used uh, for um, public transport modes. Um, I think a lot of PSC and countries are now moving towards even the uh, the production, of, for example, of e-buses. So um, I think the, uh, just the mapping of the expertise and linking the, 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 the supply of knowledge with the specific demands, priority demands of the different uh, member states um, and uh, and the cities as well could be a very useful exercise as well at the at the regional level. Thank you. Well, while I have you here, Alvin, uh, another question from and um, someone from the audience, Tin Manzano, uh, who asks uh, how you would integrate data literacy with informal transportation. So whether it's tricycles or three wheeler vehicles, and also public transportation operators, and how could the informal sector be in included? not only in the data collection, but also to benefit from it. Yes, in terms of the data collection, I think this was um, um, uh, stressed by uh, Engineer uh, Risa and, uh, uh, earlier and then Dr. Sorawit as well. I think that it's really a game changer. Um, the, uh, the paradigm shifts in terms of digitalization. Uh, it's, a, it's a game changer that uh, would uh, uh, transform how, how urban uh, transportation is being managed and planned. Um, there's a lot of opportunities in uh, directly using big data technologies, um, even passively. So even the, for example, the uh, the informal transport sector can 
can contribute towards the data generation, even not actively, like passively using user movement analytics uh, technologies that, you know, integration with existing apps. This is something that we're also doing in Africa together with the uh, Go Metro. It's, it's a company that's uh, doing user movement analytics um, using passive technologies. And um, it would give you um, very um, highly um, important data in terms of uh, different modes, how they are being used, um, the movements itself, temporal and uh, geospatial. Um, so that's uh, one one particular um, opportunity that you know um, that presents itself due to the the different developments. Um, and then in terms of the wider planning, I, as I mentioned earlier, um, um, the, the 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 treatment towards the uh, the informal transport sector. It has to be embedded at some point. We need to recognize that you know some sort of uh, transition towards more uh, cohesive. Um, maybe some uh, formalization has to be done. Um, but yeah, um, I think uh, one particular element that we can also look into is really you know having supporting plans in terms also of uh, let's say um, looking into alternative uh, livelihood programs. So one. Um, um, one thing that uh, can be explored a little bit more just to 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 also address the major gap in terms of um, um, resistance um and uh, i think uh, at, at the end of the day it it has to be cohesive not just in terms of looking at the the, the current systems but also moving forward um into the future um and towards the vision of uh, uh, sustainability in uh, urban uh, transportation systems thank you sure Thanks, Alvin. Uh, Riza, I think in uh, in Jensan, you all uh, use RFID for tricycles. Could you share a bit about that, but very quickly since we are on the Yeah, very time. quickly. Uh, also part of the collaborative research agreement we have with uh, the university is trying to put in, uh, st in strategic location on experimental basis right now, the use of the RFID scanners as well as putting RFID tags to tricycles that move in a particular area. This is basically trying to uh, get us to move into policy for geofencing because we, if we want to limit movement of a certain transport group, we need to be able to track them. And with this, we are using uh, the RFID scanner and, and the RFID reader. Uh, in terms of the planning for data and for analytics, we have also employed the use of uh, camera, traffic cameras for traffic data gathering. We machine train, uh, these are machine trained uh, equipment and we collaborated also with a uh, certain university for creating the data hubs and trying to integrate other data and they feed the analytics to the local government as an input to our transport planning process. So it's kind of good uh, relationship for a consumer producer uh, relationship involving uh, the academe, the sector itself, and the local government at the forefront of uh, sustainable planning. Thank you. Thank you, Riza. That was a wonderful example. Uh, I'll post the next question to David. This is also from someone in the audience, uh, Buena Tunak, uh, who asks, how would you focus on women, marginalized groups, and other vulnerable users uh, in for their safety and security in emerging public transport modes? Yeah, that's a, an interesting question, Ryan. Um, it's not something I've looked to into, into great detail, but um, yeah, it's, uh, we, I mean, we mainly look at, um, at road safety rather than, rather than personal safety and security. So um, it's not something I have a lot of expertise in. Jenny, would you, um, would you be able to comment on that, do you think? Yeah, again, as David said, you know, it is much more that uh, injuries. Uh, there are some groups at Monash University who have looked into um, personal safety and uh, particularly um, the gender issues. Again, I don't know that research that well, but we can certainly follow up um, and get some information to um, anybody in the audience uh, via you, Ryan, or anybody else. And I do, I'd look, it's an important issue. And, uh, you know, certainly um, keeping transport environments um, safe in terms of personal security is is a, a, an enormous issue for many women. Okay. Thanks, uh, Jenny and David. I'll move on then to another audience question from Gina Alifia Nabila. 
who asks about uh, shifting to a smarter and sustainable mobility system and about what governments in ASEAN are going to do about the private transportation modes that are already entrenched within the system but are not energy sustainable and what kind of plans are in place regarding that and how would future selling of these transportation modes be changed to uh, create a more sustainable landscape. So maybe uh, Riza and Alvin, if you could quickly comment on that. Well, in, in the case of Jensen, I think uh, we would be, uh, I have to admit that we would be far off yet as to the regulation of the use of a private transport vehicle. Because right now, I think the sharing that we have in terms of the public transport, it's between 70% public and around 30% private uh, car users. One of the measures we put in in our policy is trying to put a monitoring system for the sale of motorized tricycle. Because we see that as a component for the informal uh, mode, which is the tricycle. So right now we are monitoring those that are selling these kinds of uh, vehicle and ask them to report to the local government through a submission in the online platform that we created so we can track actually if there's going to be a massive increase in terms of uh, sale and even in the number of units that they dispose. So we can also keep tab on what is going to be the increase of this kind of vehicle into the roadway system that we have. This is like a very, very fledgling um, effort, but then that's, I think that's the only way we can try to control uh, the increase of uh, the use of this smaller capacity vehicle that also cause congestion on the road. I, I don't know if it's relevant to the question of uh, the audience. I hope it has cleared up things for them. Alvin, do you want to yeah. ship in? Yeah, yeah. Um, th th thank you very much uh, for the question. Uh, if I may just add, maybe in, in relation to that, maybe just a couple of uh, insights on what's happening um, um, towards, you know, moving moving towards uh, more energy efficient, less polluting vehicles. I think a lot of uh, things are happening um, both at the national as well as the urban level. At the national level, we can think about from a regulatory standpoint, um, um, fuel economy standards, for example, and emission standards are uh, being updated. Um, and I think in, in some of the ASEAN countries, they're also moving. I think Thailand has moved into some sort of a, um, carbon-based uh, type of uh, fuel economy standards for new new vehicles. Um, that's uh, so we would see more and more uh, fuel efficient, uh, carbon less carbon intensive uh, vehicles on the fleet uh, moving forward. Um, but also in terms of the uh, the other measures that are being implemented, there's uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, also developments in terms of the. Um, the, at the urban level, we talk, we we, we look into um, things like operational operational uh, restrictions uh, that are moving towards, some, you know, incentivizing more efficient uh, types of vehicles. I think uh, this is happening within the next years in in Hanoi, for example. But that's more on the two wheeler side of things. But uh, there's, um, it, it's supposed to also spur the the move towards, uh, let's say, more. Um, less polluting uh, vehicles, electric vehicles, for example. Uh, so there's a mixture um, dip, um, in, 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 in the different uh, um, member states in terms of what's happening more at the national level, what's happening more at the, uh, the local levels. But there are these types of developments that are happening um, currently. Yeah. So thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Alvin. So it seems that we are uh, rounding up the hour, and I would uh, like to begin concluding the session. Just a few concluding remarks uh, based on uh, our speaker contributions. Uh, I think it was lovely that uh, our main focus of almost all of our speakers was that at the center of everything, including uh, a sustainable mobility landscape, is people and community. And this is something that we have to be focusing on uh, at every aspect. Uh, main part of this, of course, as raised by Jenny and David, is an aspect of road safety. That should be the basis of our planning for uh, for the transportation system. Also to focus a little bit on uh, creating governance and policy frameworks for, uh, for 
incorporating sustainable modes and also using data, whether big data or open data systems for using information that's happening on ground and making decisions with them and planning our cities accordingly. Also, not forgetting the large number of informal operators that are there in uh, our cities and how do we bring them into the fold because they do play an important part in the mobility landscape. So how do we integrate them with the larger system? And lastly, in, of course, the avoid shift uh, uh, improve paradigm. And the one which we're talking about improve is that about the energy systems, whether we are moving on to new technology or uh, also creating uh, disincentives for the existing unsustainable energy modes so that overall we have a better environment in the ASEAN cities and, and the member states. So that's it from all of us today. Thank you to all our panelists and Riza for her presentation on General Santos. Uh, I would invite all our audience members to participate in the training session that is on implementing public transport plans that will be in half an hour from now and look forward to seeing you all there. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.